Uh, Please open your Bibles with me to the book of James. We're continuing to work our way through this book, and today we're going to be looking at James chapter 5, verses 7 through 12. James 5, 7 through 12. Um, if If you were in town last night, you might have noticed it was homecoming weekend here in Mount Pleasant. Uh, Guys and girls who, they may usually go around town on a typical Saturday evening in a t-shirt, sweatpants, and Crocs, Uh, but not last night. They were seen in parks and restaurants and all kinds of other places wearing dress shoes and suits and ties and fancy dresses and boutonnieres, all the stuff, right? If you were enjoying a meal at Culver's on a normal Saturday evening and saw six teenagers walk into the restaurant in all those fancy clothes, you might wonder what in the world is going on. But if you know it's homecoming weekend, it's no surprise, right? Uh, When you are aware of the situation, actions that typically seem unusual make more sense. Uh, People use the phrase situational awareness. Situational awareness. They use that to talk about all sorts of things. Uh, Some might be talking about security, uh, knowing where the doors and windows are, identifying potential threats. Uh, Unfortunately, we've seen some of this in the news recently. Uh, the Secret Service having to look at buildings and even golf courses in a way we typically don't have to. Uh, When I go golfing, I I don't generally see any people in suits talking in radios or scanning the perimeter. Uh, When I walk by, I'm just a regular guy, right? Expendable, I suppose. But when a president or even a former president steps on a scene, the situation changes. And therefore, people's actions change, and and appropriately so. Uh, Situational awareness is important with weather. Uh, We've heard of many people suffering in the South after Hurricane uh, Helene swept through. There may be a number of people who wish, sadly wish, that they were more aware of what was coming so they would have taken different action earlier and avoided some of the devastation. Uh, There are certainly others who are aware of the situation now as it stands and are doing things they normally wouldn't do to try to lend a hand, right? Uh, We also think about situational awareness in sports Uh, If a quarterback threw a football high in the air and 50 yards down the field for anyone who could jump the highest, no matter what team they're on, whoever can jump the highest can catch it. If a quarterback did that in the first quarter of the game, the coach might be a little upset. But if it's the last play of the game and his team is down by four or five points, the coach might call that kind of a play on purpose and tell his quarterback to do that very thing that would have gotten him benched earlier in the game. That's a specific situation that warrants a very different action. Uh, If you're playing basketball and there's a half a second left on the clock, your team is down three points, and you get the ball in your hands, the first thing you think is, "Uh uh-oh, right? But then if you're down three and the ball's in your hands, should you go try to make a layup? No, because that's worth two points, and your team is down by... Three, even if you're not a great shooter, your situation requires a unique action, right? Shoot the ball. Okay. Situational awareness can can be important in relationships as well. Uh, An old friend of mine, his family, they were all big Ohio State fans. Bless their heart. (laughs) And they finished their basement and made it all Ohio State Buckeyes. Everything down there was Ohio State Buckeyes. It was a great place to watch the game if you're a Buckeye fan. Uh, And I have a feeling it's going to be a great place to watch the game this year. Bless our hearts. Um, But if I were to go down there on the day of the big game in my Michigan Wolverine gear and and let out a hearty, go blue, I would be lacking situational awareness (laughs) in that moment, in that place. Okay, you get the idea? Now, now, we can think of some people in the Bible who had some uh, great situational awareness. Uh, I think about Rahab in the wall of Jericho. She had heard about all the Lord had done, believed that God had promised Israel that land. She knew how big and strong the wall of Jericho was, but she believed that God was bigger and stronger, right? And so being aware of the situation, she rightly sided with the Lord and his people. How about Elijah at Mount Carmel? In opposition to the 450 prophets of Baal, that false god, 450 verses 1. Those odds seem pretty bleak. But Elijah understood the situation. It was 450 prophets plus a false god that doesn't really exist versus one prophet and the one true 
all-powerful God. Elijah acted wisely and trusted the Lord of glory to glorify himself that day, and the Lord prevailed. Perhaps you've thought of David in the midst of all this. As a young man, even a boy, uh, he wondered how it could be that a Philistine giant would be so foolish and audacious to curse the living God and his people. David stood opposite the Philistine warrior and that champion. Uh, Goliath had size, armor, uh, huge, heavy weapons. David had a sling and a stone, no armor at all. But David had something that Goliath did not. Goliath had defiled the living God and God would deliver Goliath into David's hand that day. It would normally be pretty foolish for a boy with a sling and a stone to charge ahead of a far larger, better equipped, experienced soldier like that. But David was situationally aware. He knew the Lord of hosts was on his side, or better, that he was on the side of the Lord of hosts. All this being said, when we are situationally aware, we are better prepared, able to think and to respond in ways we may not normally do. Certain situations require certain responses. Specific situations necessitate specific actions. And when we know where we are, when we know what situation we find ourselves in, we can be better prepared to perform those actions that are called for, okay? In the book of James, remember, we find Christian people who were enduring hardships. They were suffering in different ways. Uh, many of them were struggling with persecution, and then, in the midst of that, struggling with a lack of resources, a lack of work, a lack of income. And in the first six verses of James 5, we looked at that last week, we saw James rebuke and warn the wicked rich. Uh, wicked rich that were taking advantage of the poor, taking advantage of workers whose needs were very great. And the wicked rich were taking advantage of those workers in a way to pad their own pockets to further enrich themselves monetarily. And James warned them. They were, they were fattening their pocketbooks, maybe, but they were fattening their hearts. Uh, and James said they were fattening themselves for the slaughter, for judgment. Judgment was coming, and they were going to be judged justly. Now, in verse 7, as we get to our passage for today, James turns his attention back to believers. And he's again going to uh, appeal to the coming of the Lord. But for Christians, that awareness elicits a different set of responses. Okay? Our awareness of the situation necessitates a different set of actions. So let's look at God's word and see what we can learn today. I'm going to go ahead and read the whole passage first. So James 5, 7 through 12, starting verse 7. This first command here, be patient. Therefore, brothers, until the coming of the Lord, see how the farmer waits for the precious fruit of the earth, being patient about it, until it receives the early and the late rains. You also be patient. Establish your hearts, for the coming of the Lord is at hand. Verse 9 says, Do not grumble against one another, brothers, so that you may not be judged. Behold, the judge is standing at the door. As an example of suffering and patience, brothers, take the prophets who spoke in the name of the Lord. Behold, we consider those blessed who remained steadfast. You have heard of the steadfastness of Job, and you have seen the purpose of the Lord, how the Lord is compassionate and merciful. But above all, my brothers, do not swear, either by heaven or by earth or by any other oath, but let your yes be yes and your no be no, so that you may not fall under condemnation." Okay, the, the structure of this passage, it's pretty interesting. There are two do's and there are two don'ts in this text. Uh, the theme of verses 7 and 8 is be patient. Be patient. And then verse 9 says do not grumble. So that's one set. Be patient. Do not grumble. Then verses 10 and 11. We see another call to patience, but also with the word uh, steadfast or steadfastness repeated. Then in verse 12, we're told, do not swear or, or do not take an oath. Or even better, as we'll see later, do not make any hasty, uh, flippant, or even deceptive promises. So do you see the structure there? Verses 7 and 8 go together and are paired with verse 9. 
and then 10 and 11 go together, and they are paired with verse 12. So just a very nice, symmetrical passage, isn't it? Uh, I, I think it's helpful when we see all this to better understand the argument that's being presented in the text, not just the individual points in each verse, but the overall argument of the text as a whole. Okay, so that's, that's the structure. That's how we're going to cover all these bases this morning. Uh, so the first, the first sentence in verse 7 says this, Be patient, therefore, brothers, until the coming of the Lord. Uh, the therefore uh, ties us back to verses 1 through 6 in the context. Uh, Since those who take advantage of you, the the person is supposed to hear, because those who are taking advantage of you are fattening their own hearts for the slaughter, since those who have oppressed and sinned against you will see the judgment of God, be patient. Because that's true, be patient. Uh, The word brothers confirms James has come back to this target audience of uh, believers, followers of Jesus Christ, and their command is to be patient. Uh, The word in the Greek that's translated as patient it's a compound word. It has two parts. Uh, the first part means long. It's elongated. And the second part would be translated as anger or as temper. Uh, so the word is long-tempered. So instead of being short-tempered, be long-tempered. Instead of being, maybe we might say short-fused, be long Fused. Uh, the word carries the idea of bearing up under provocation. You're being provoked by other people. Uh, so even, even though the wicked rich were mistreating them, uh, covered in verses 1 through 6, these Christians were to be long fused, patient, because Jesus is coming. Uh, the judgment is coming, God will set everything straight. Christians, we don't need to take matters into our own hands. And why would we if we know that God has a hold of the situation? You think of a a short fuse. If we're going to go boom, an outburst of anger, that's nothing. It accomplishes nothing compared to the true, right, and just response of all-powerful God. Does that make sense? We're not helping things when our fuses are short. Uh, I read to you last week from Romans 12, and it's worth repeating. Romans 12, 19. Beloved, never avenge yourselves, but leave it to the wrath of God. For it's written, vengeance is mine. I will repay, says the Lord. So, so how long does our fuse need to be? How long do we have to wait before the fuse has burned all the way down and we get to explode and feel justified for it? What does verse 7 say? Until the coming of the Lord. So our fuse is to be as long as it takes for Jesus to come back. Meaning, we don't need to explode. Ever. That's something to chew on, right? I don't need to explode. Ever. (laughs) Sometimes you're like, oh, but I really feel... Uh, Like, if I don't explode it now, I'm just going to die. Internal combustion. I'm just going to, it's going to be terrible. We don't. And we don't have to when we remember and if we are satisfied with the reality that when Christ returns, he will perfectly execute whatever justice needs meted out. Do we trust him? Okay? We truly and permanently can leave it to God. Be patient, therefore, brothers, until the coming of the Lord. And I think, church, that frees us up. We are not the judge. We don't have to go boom. God has promised to take care of whatever is needed that way. And we remember, in humility, I deserve judgment. And God has been gracious to me. He has shown me compassion And so when I remember all those truths, then that frees me up. I don't need to make sure that all these people get the wrath that they need to get. I don't need to give them a taste of it so that they can get their appetites whetted before God comes. I get to be compassionate towards them as God has been so very compassionate towards me. We're freed. We're freed. Uh, James then gives an illustration in verse 7. He says, See, or, or look, behold, how the farmer waits for the precious fruit of the earth, being patient about it until it receives the early and the late rains. 
Um, in Israel, planting season starts for farmers in, in late October, early November. That's the time of the early rains. And then rainy season would be during our winter. And then the late rains, or the latter rains, are in late March to early April. So it kind of, for us, that might kind of feel like upside down, but that's what it is for Israel. Those early rains and the later rains are necessary to get the most out of the harvest. That's all. So a farmer might be tempted to plant too early, uh, to take matters into his own hands, to think he's got a corner on how this is going to work. He might get anxious and try to get their, the harvest too soon. They might feel like they're missing out if they don't get started on their own timetable. They might see a farmer on the property next over and say, oh man, he's already got his tractors fired up and I'm just sitting here. I better get going. I'm worried that this isn't going to go good. Does he know something I don't know? Right? The anxiety of all that coming up in our hearts and minds. But if they don't wait, if they're not patient, they won't get all they could out of their crops. So verse 8 says, you also be patient. Be long-tempered, long fused with people. Establish your hearts for the coming of the Lord is at hand. At hand means imminent. It could happen at any time. We are to live as though Christ could return at any moment because he could. We are to be always ready and being found ready when he returns. Uh, With our hope being placed in Christ our hope and expectation of his rule and reign, of his perfect justice, we establish our hearts in him. Not in our ability to fix our circumstances, but we we establish our hearts in him, and that allows us to be patient while we wait. Uh, If we aren't hoping hoping in him, well, again, we'll think we'll need to take matters in our own hands, uh, but that's not the way to go. If we really trust the Lord to take care of matters in his time, then we have the ability to be long-fused. So if I'm struggling and saying, Boy, I can't figure out why I get so angry so fast. I cannot control my outburst. We can go back to Jesus. Do I really trust that God's going to take care of this? Do I really trust that the gospel truths are, are real and that this is their hope? And if we do, we may find <laughs> that our fuses get a little longer over time. Okay. So the command of verses 8 and 9 is be patient. Jesus is coming. Then verse 9, the do not. Verse 9. Do not grumble or complain against one another, brothers, so that you may not be judged. Behold, the judge is standing at the door. Uh, Do you see how the do not, grumbling, goes with the do? Be patient. What do we tend to do first when we're under stress because of the foolish actions of others? As Jesus said in Matthew 15, 18, what comes out of the mouth proceeds from the heart. Uh, when we're struggling with the actions of others, we, we can be prone to, if we'll admit it, <laughs> we can be prone to grumble and complain. Uh, the Apostle Paul in Philippians 2, 14, 15 wrote, uh, Do all things without grumbling or disputing, that you may be blameless and innocent, children of God without blemish in the midst of a crooked and twisted generation, among whom you shine as lights in the world by being different, Right? A person who has the ability to go through hardship, to be wronged by others, and to go on without grumbling, that person is going to stick out. They're going to look different. Uh, The world is not looking forward to the return of Christ. It's not on their radar. They're taking matters then, therefore, into their own hands. It is a self-focused solution to the problems of the world. So think... A self-focused solution to the problems of the world is going to result in at least grumbling and complaining. I'm not getting what I want. People aren't treating me the way that I think I ought to be treated. Uh, If I am the center of my universe and other people don't worship me the way that I do, if God gets really, really small and I get really, really big that way, I'm going to protest everybody else's failure to bow down to my desires. That's how we are naturally inclined. We have to fight against that, but we make ourselves the judge that way, and then we feel validated in casting judgment and complaining and grumbling against other people. And the word tells us, it reminds us, the judge, the true judge, is standing at the door. That's why James gives us this warning, uh, refrain from grumbling. That's part of the world's self-focused solution. But Christ is our solution. He is our answer. And he stands at the door. Again, that is a, a, refer- a reference to his imminency. And we might hear uh, about the imminency of Christ's return, and we might say this. 
Didn't James write this 2,000 years ago? That doesn't feel very imminent. (laughs) How imminent is Christ's return? But as Tim read for us this morning uh, from 2 Peter 3, one day to the Lord is as a thousand years and a thousand years as one day. Even for us, think about this, when we're in eternity, when we're with, with Jesus forever, and we've been up there for a year and 10 and 20 and a thousand and 10,000 and still in perfect glory forever, no sickness, no death, this life will feel like a vapor, won't it? And besides the, the temporal realities, throughout the New Testament, we aren't supposed to specifically uh, guesstimate the exact moment of Christ's return. So we think about the imminence of Christ, we say, well, when could he be coming? Uh, oh, I'm going to look and see. Okay, let's forecast this. I think it's going to be on this day, this month, this time. And then we might get that wrong, and some people have tried that, and they've failed, and they kind of recalibrate, and they try it again. We're not supposed to do that. But we do live for him in such a way to love him and to love our neighbors as ourselves so that if he should return at any moment, uh, he would find us actively pursuing him when he comes. Okay, so, so we're not, not sitting on a lawn chair looking into the sky, not that kind of ready, okay? But a busy living life the way he called us to kind of ready. Uh, imagine if you, if you got a job and you knew the boss was making his rounds just to kind of see how everybody was doing. And so because you knew your boss was coming and you didn't know exactly when he was going to come in the door in your area where you're working in the factory, you set up a chair and you sit on the chair and you stare at the door. Meanwhile, the conveyor belt behind you is still moving and the parts are stacking up and they're, and they're getting broken and scratched and torn and all that kind of stuff, right? And the boss opens the door and you go, ha, I knew you were coming soon. I was ready. <laughs> would that be a good day for you? And hopefully you go, oh wait, that wasn't a good idea. And they'll let you know that wasn't a good idea probably pretty quickly. Now, to be found ready is that when that boss walks into the room, there you are at your station and you're doing your task to the best of your ability for the good of all, right? That's being ready. And that's how we're to think about it as Christians, okay? So because we know that Jesus is coming, And because we know that when he comes, he's bringing justice with him, when other people provoke, when other people bring burdens into our lives, we have the ability through Christ to have a long fuse and to be patient. And that patient, that patience allows us to hold our tongues to refrain from grumbling. Okay? So that's the first set in our structure. Now for round two, verse 10. Verse 10. As an example of suffering and patience, brothers, Take the prophets who spoke in the name of the Lord, referring to uh, prophets in the Old Testament. So think of Moses, Elijah, Isaiah, or Jeremiah. Verse 11 says, Behold, look, we consider those blessed. So, So when we think about them, we think of them as blessed who remain and remained steadfast. Uh, James enters a new word here, the word steadfast. Patience is the key word of verses 7 and 8, and now we see this word steadfast. These words are very similar, of course, uh, but this word carries the idea of bearing up under the load in the face of difficult circumstances. Uh, The long-fused patience of verses 7 and 8 had to do with the provocation of other people, dealing with people, uh, being long-tempered when people frustrate us, but the steadfastness has more to do with enduring the difficulty of our circumstances the things people are doing to us on the one hand and the difficulties of life in a fallen world on the other. Being long-tempered versus enduring. You see the difference? Verse 11 continues. You have heard of the steadfastness, the endurance of Job. And you have seen the purpose of the Lord or the end or the final goal achieved. How the Lord is compassionate and merciful. Uh, First, what was the endurance or the steadfastness of Job? Uh, we just finished studying this, this this morning in Sunday school in the class that meets here in the auditorium at, at 9.30 on Sunday mornings. Uh, but Job was a man who trusted in the Lord and lived a characteristically li- righteous life. And then Satan thought he could change that. He thought he could take one of God's men away if he could change the situations, the circumstances of his life. And God providentially gave Satan permission to try that. 
So all Job's possessions, all of his children, and later his health were all taken away, and and in short order. It was devastating. So much so, Job's friends came to grieve with him. And they did so quite well for the first uh, seven days until they started talking. (laughs) And they tried in their conversation to find out why is all this bad stuff happening. And if you remember from that book, Uh, Bad things happen to bad people, therefore you're a bad guy. That was the logic, so Job, you must be doing a bunch of terrible things. Now, in the course of all Job's suffering, and in response to his friend's accusations and assumptions that his suffering was proof that he was a bad dude who deserved to suffer, Job wished, he said, I wish that I could see God and make my appeal and be found innocent. Job wished for that. And then when God showed up, When God revealed some of who he is, what did Job do? What did Job do when he finally saw God for who he is? It says that he covered his mouth and repented in dust and ashes. Isn't it amazing that in this passage in James 5, James encourages us that if we remember that Jesus is coming, if we remember who God is and what he's doing and what he's going to do, we won't struggle so much to open our mouths in ways we ought not. And when Job saw God for who he is, he felt the need to put his hand over his mouth. That's very interesting, isn't it? And according to James, uh, what have we seen? So Job wanted to see God, and James says, we have. Uh, We who, unlike Job, uh, live after the coming of Jesus Christ as our suffering servant. Uh, After Job's Redeemer and ours came to redeem us through his death on the cross, his burial, his resurrection, we, we know of his ascension, In Exodus 34, God revealed himself as a merciful God. He is a God of compassion and mercy, forgiving the sins of his people. And he accomplished that. That purpose was fulfilled. Justice was served against our sin through the substitutionary sacrifice of Jesus Christ on the cross. Christ paid the price of our sin debt and all who believe in his work for us and turn to him as Lord and Savior are saved. So Job longed to see the Lord. He looked forward to seeing his coming Redeemer, and he was able to endure to remain steadfast through the difficulties he faced. And we, Christians, look back to our Redeemer who came and who is coming again, and through him and his sure promises, we can endure as well. We can be steadfast through the challenging circumstances that we face in this life. So then, with that whole Uh, putting our hand over our mouth thing in our minds again. Let's look at verse 12, the last verse of our passage today. It says, But above, above all, brothers, do not swear, either by heaven or by earth or by any other oath, but let your yes be yes and your no be no, so that you may not fall under condemnation. Uh, first, know that James is not talking here about uttering curse words, okay? This is, these are not choice words that would make your mother want to wash your mouth out with soap. It's not that kind of a thing, Okay? This swearing here is proclaiming a binding agreement to guarantee a promise with collateral. Uh, Jesus rebuked the Pharisees for this very thing. In Matthew 23, verse 16 through 22, Jesus said this to the Pharisees. He said, Woe to you blind guides who say, and this is what their practice was, if anyone swears by the temple, it's nothing. It doesn't mean anything. But if somebody swears by the gold of the temple, then he's bound to his oath. Then he has to do what he said. Jesus says, you blind fools. For which is greater, the gold or the temple that's made the gold sacred? And then you say, if anybody swears by the altar, it's nothing. Not binding. But if anybody swears by the gift that's on the altar, then he's bound by his oath. You blind men, Jesus said. For which is greater, the gift or the altar that makes the gift sacred? So whoever swears by the altar swears by it and everything on it, and whoever swears by the temple swears by it and by him who dwells in it, by the Lord. And whoever swears by heaven swears by the throne of God and by him who sits on it. So the Pharisees were making contracted promises to people and using specific wording in order to get themselves out of actually fulfilling the promises. So I I swear to you, I promise you, that I will, I will present to you uh, this much money and I promise it to you by the altar of God. Whoa, by the altar of God, that sounds pretty intense. And the person walks away thinking, this person's gonna do what they promised. And the Pharisee's thinking, ha, 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 ha. I used the altar loophole. 
now I don't have to do what I said. And they had written it out and believed it that they hadn't sinned either because they had done it according to their policies. That's what they were doing. Okay, so obviously that's wrong. So maybe our closest example today would be crossing our fingers behind our back when we make a promise to somebody. Okay, that's what they were doing. Jesus is telling them to knock it off and saying, just be honest. Be forthright. Say what you're going to do and then do it. Earn a reputation by being trustworthy. Okay? Now, if you're struggling, if you're going through a ton of hardships as the recipients of this letter from James were, if you need a bunch of help, the kind of help which would, uh, you would need if your wicked rich employer was withholding your paychecks, what kind of oath might you swear? They might have had temptation, say, if you give me X number of dollars, I, I, I promise you I will pay it back to you next week. And if it was popular at the time by religious leaders to do a cross your fingers behind your back kind of a promise, what might these Christians have been tempted to do? If that's the norm for their culture. But Christians, that's not how we live, is it? That's not how followers of Jesus live. That's not how Christians love our neighbors. So let your yes be yes and your no be no. Live with integrity. Earn people's trust with your actions. Endure. Be steadfast. The Lord is coming. You don't need to rely on the world's sometimes deceitful methods to get by. Okay, so situational awareness. What situation were these early Christians in? Uh, they were being mistreated by a wicked, rich landowner, businessmen, bosses, who may have been committing fraud and not paying them what they were due for an honest day's work. That was verses six, uh, one through six here in chapter five. But that was their earthly situation. That was tough. They were, they were suffering, they were struggling. And what might they have been tempted to do with that? Even against their brothers and sisters in Christ. Well, it'd be easy in that situation. I think if we're being honest, it'd be easy to grumble a little bit. It'd be easy to complain. It'd be easy to, we can't yell at the boss man, so who do we yell at? This person who we love, who's right next to us. And we can, we can accuse them of not doing things that are really nothing compared to what the guy I can't talk to that I'm scared to talk to is doing to me. Does that make sense? But what was their fuller, bigger, and more secure situation? What was their situation? What is the very same situation that we are all in today? No matter what other kinds of earthly situations we might be dealing with, and everybody here has a whole myriad of different things that we're going through, no matter what provocations people are bringing our way, no matter what difficulties may lie before us, or that we feel like we're stuck in right now, what is our situation? Church, the Lord is at hand. The judge is standing at the door. Jesus is coming. And he is for his people. He is for you. Uh, one big thing I really appreciate about this passage, when, when we say, Jesus is coming, given our natural tendencies, or maybe mine, we, we might be prone to freak out a little bit. Uh, anxiety will break out. We better get busy. We better fix this. We better do that. We better not rest. We better try harder. We got a bunch of people to figure out and to get them ready. And it's all riding on me. <laughs> we might think those kinds of things. But in this context, what does James tell us to do? Jesus is coming. Be patient. <laughs> Be patient. Jesus is coming. Be steadfast. And it's funny because we might say, oh, well, I can do that. Can we? <laughs> it may not be what we're prone to do. That's why the Bible tells us we better do that. <laughs> Jesus is coming. Be patient. Jesus is coming. Be steadfast. Jesus is coming. Have a long fuse with people. Jesus is coming. Endure these hardships. And why? Because I am not my champion. I'm not the hero. Jesus is my hero. Jesus is my redeemer. Jesus is my rescuer. Jesus is the savior. 
and Jesus is the judge. So church, Jesus is coming. Be patient. He's got this. (laughs) No worries. And be steadfast. Victory's coming. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for this reminder today. Uh, We thank you that you are a compassionate God. We can can look at a passage like this and think about your uh, grandeur, uh, your, your omniscience, your omnipotence, your sovereignty, and we might come off and say um, to everybody, just stop worrying. Don't, don't, don't freak out. God has this. If you're worrying, you're just crazy. But Lord, you also know that we are but dust and you call on us to cast our cares on you because you care for us. So God, thank you for being a compassionate God. And I pray that we would do that very thing, that when anxieties come, when provocations come, when, when difficulties uh, that we need to endure come in our lives, uh, God, cause us to remember that we can cast all of those things on you, that we can turn to you, know that you are a God who sees and who hears and who acts. And then God, help us to remember that Jesus is coming and that when he does, uh, he's gonna bring justice with him and all things will be made right. God, we thank you for the compassion and mercy that you showed to us, knowing that we are not right, knowing that we have sin in our hearts, uh, and knowing, though, that Jesus Christ was sent to die for our sin, to pay the penalty that we owe, so that we could be called uh, innocent, not guilty, and that his righteousness would be put to our account, that we could become your children, and all of this by faith, through your grace, in Jesus alone. God, I do pray if there's anybody here today who's not put their faith and trust in Christ alone as Savior and Lord, that today would be the day of their salvation. May we as a church have a heart for these people and encourage them and love them and point them and others that we meet in the community this week to Jesus. Help us to remember who we are and who our Lord is. And God, give us long fuses and endurance uh, knowing that our King is coming. And I pray all this in Christ.